The New Jersey Institute of Technology will officially become the 10th member institution of the America East Conference on July 1, and I'm pleased to be joined by both leaders of both parties, two leaders in Division One college athletics who have gotten a, quite a bit of face time over the last week. So I hope this isn't overkill for either of you, but I'm pleased to introduce Lenny Kaplan, the Associate Vice President and Director of Athletics at NJIT 2018 NACTA Athletic Director of the Year, wrapping up his 20th year at NJIT alongside our esteemed commissioner at the America East Conference, Amy Huchthausen. She is wrapping up her ninth year at the helm. So again, pleased to be joined by both of you. Congratulations on the, uh, the big news over the past week. Thank you very much. We're very excited to, uh, to become part of the America East and look forward to getting going. So how long has this been in the works? And Lenny, I guess I'll throw it right back to you because it wasn't too long ago that your basketball program was, was independent at NJIT. Yeah, you know, so we've we've had a very interesting um, uh, Division One trajectory. Uh, we started this move back in 04 and 05, and uh, that was probably my first conversation with uh, the previous commissioner of the America East. And Amy and I have spoken many times over the years. We've been in the Great West um, from 08 to 13 as kind of like a scheduling alliance and became like a conference uh, without NCAA uh, championship uh, access. But at least it gave us schedules, especially for basketball, which, you know, when you have basketball schedules, you can't really get too many games after January 1st. Uh, we were able to fill our schedules. Uh, then at 13, we became an independent again. Um, when the, most of the Great West teams joined the uh, Western Athletic Conference, and I was the only East Coast team, so there's really no, no room for me. Um, and then we got lucky, you know, the uh, Atlantic Sun lost a member, uh, and we joined the Atlantic Sun. Um, which eventually became the A Sun as we call it now. Uh, did that for five years, and um, as we're talking about with this COVID and scheduling and trying to do more regionalized scheduling, this conversation of regional scheduling kind of morphed into a, uh, a, a membership commitment for us, and, and we couldn't be more excited. And Amy, from your perspective, I know it's been uh, a long-stated goal. That's how it was phrased in the in the press release to have ten member institutions in America East. Yeah, I think, you know, nine, we've certainly been really happy with our nine institutions, but 10, just from a, from a practical perspective for scheduling, particularly in men's women's basketball, which is our, our premier sports, you know, the even number just makes that a little bit easier on our teams for scheduling. And then as, as I mentioned yesterday in the press conference, you know, as, as other conferences start to increase their number of, of league games from, you know, 18 to 20, and I think I've seen some even contemplating 22, that just reduces the non-conference inventory available to, to our schools. So uh, there's a practical component to that from a scheduling perspective. There's also, you know, a, con a contribution component to it as well. NJIT, certainly a men's basketball program in particular, on the rise, you know, having just two years ago, I think, receiving AP votes. And so you're always looking for teams that can make your league better and contribute to your overall, um, you know, RPI and net and, and ratings in that re respect. Um, but ultimately, it was, um, you know, one of the reasons why it's maybe taken a little bit longer to get to 10 is you're looking for the right institution. You know, we, we want teams that can make our, or schools rather, that can contribute to making basketball or soccer or lacrosse or volleyball better. But at the end of the day, you've got to re feel really good about the institutions that, you're, that are sitting around the table with you and, and know that there's an alignment in institutional profile and, and uh, academic commitment. And, and things of that nature, the values align, uh, the ge geography aligns, and those are all really the, the ultimate drivers for, in my view, of conference realignment as our board and our athletics directors looked at it. So it took a minute to get to 10, but I feel really pleased that we have our 10th member that I think it, it really is an ideal fit in all three of those metrics, if you will, the academics, the athletics, and the geography. Amy, I've thought that for years, but you know. Finally, you came around. I know, I know. I'm a slow learner, Lenny. <laughs> a follow-up to that, Amy, uh, in terms of NJIT being, like you said, the, the perfect fit, uh, how long had they been on your radar? I know, Lenny, you talked about having conversations with our previous commissioner, but, but for you, Amy, how long was, was NJIT really, I don't want to say sought after necessarily, but um, yeah. on your radar? 
I mean, they were on my radar probably shortly after I moved to Cambridge mm -hmm. back in the fall of 2011. You know, I think one of my early visitors that fall, I'd have to, I don't know if I could go back and pinpoint the date, but one of my early visitors, uh, I believe even before the calendar turned to 2012, was Lenny and Dr. Bloom. Uh, I think they were up in Boston doing some fundraising and wanted to, you know, introduce themselves to me, um, give me the history of their previous conversation with my predecessor. And it also just let them know, let me know of their of their interest. And so, you know, in that respect, NGIT has been on the radar to answer your question, Sam, ever since I started. And then it's just a matter of right time, right place uh, for all of these things to fall into place. Because I do believe, I do believe in the notion of right time, right place. And I think today, you know, this time in, in June of, of 2020 is the right time, right place for NGIT, you know, certainly maybe it could have been activated sooner but i think um you know the stars align when they align and to, to, to me that is that is right now how unique is it to be right now because obviously we're having this conversation virtually i would prefer it face to face but we're not able to do that uh and i guess my my question in terms of making the move during this time what's the most challenging part in terms of you know working out the logistics and i guess does it turn any heads seeing that you're making a move? We know there's some financial um, effects and repercussions to making this move for, for both parties. Um, but what, what sort of challenges were presented in terms of making this move during COVID-19? Um, I, I think the biggest thing was, you know, in-person contact, you know, it's normally, you know, when you do a presentation, you do it in front of everybody, you get to meet some people. Many times the president's there with you. Um, in some cases, you meet with the ADs first, then you meet the presidents. Um, and I think you, you lose a lot of that. Transitionally, a lot of it is then all done by email and, and phone call and scheduling and getting up to date. But um, a lot of this probably would have started with an in-person meeting with Amy and myself, um, followed by you know an in-person presentation, um, and then maybe a presentation to the president. So I think a lot of the person-to-person -person contact, which we in athletics love every day, right? Like we. We're in this to be with the student athletes. We're in this to help them. That's what we do. Um, and that's just been missing the whole time from our, uh, uh, the last three months per se. But I think that's probably the biggest thing that's been missing. It makes it maybe a little harder. Um, I mean, for a while, Amy and I were talking or texting, you know, a couple of times a night, you know, it's a uh, phone call almost every day. And then I'm have to call somebody else and she's got to reach out and she's got to check on something. So, uh, I think a lot of times when everyone's in a room together, you get a lot more questions answered quicker. Um, just like working, right? You have a question, you can't go down the hall and ask, you know, somebody else. They can't get the answer to the question. You got to call them, and if they're not there, you know, you got to call them back, or they got to call you back, and it becomes an hour sometimes to get an answer to a very simple question you would have normally in about seconds. So, I think that was probably the biggest challenge of this this process. Um, but I do think that all the work and research we've done on the American East and how we fit. And I think all the work in the past that Amy's done of how we fit on that side, it made some of this go really, really fast. I mean, we did this at, at a pretty quick pace, Amy, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah, very, very quick. And I, um, yeah, definitely the in-person would have helped in some places, but, in, but at the same time, we got this done so efficiently, candidly, from your end and our end, that I don't know that I would have wanted to delay it with any in-person you know, meetings and things like that. But no, what Lenny just just mentioned, Sam, I think is is really core piece of this because there's been a familiarity between the, you know the institution and the people. You know, Dr. Bloom and Lenny have been there the entire time that I've been commissioner, and that certainly helps. Uh, and have stayed in touch here and there as just professional colleagues, not always talking about conference alignment issues, but just being really good colleagues and and acquaintances in that respect has certainly been helpful. But yeah, there. The research that both parties have done on each other over the years and maintain that um, really makes it makes it move a lot a lot quicker. We were not strangers to each other um, by any stretch of the imagination. So a lot of that preliminary work that is usually done in a conference exploration, both from an institution and the conference office perspective or league perspective, uh, we we'd already done done some of that. So it, it made the final decision points I think real, move really quickly. And let it be known, the, the uh, common theme in college athletics is summer is a little bit of a dead time, and you may think that, okay, it's June, maybe it was easy to put this together. But I know you two are on calls constantly during this, this pandemic. And 
Lenny, it's, it sounds like you're you're in agreement in, in a well, little bit. Here's what I'll say. Um, you know, June is a bunch of the dead time, as everybody thinks. You know, that's when, and Amy knows because she's been on NCA committees. That's when we all meet. We have our end of year AD meetings and, and commit, um, conference meetings between the end of May, sometimes into June, um, basketball coaches meetings and things like that. You know, when I started in this business um, in Division One, the basketball, the baseball champions like May 3rd, right? And then you didn't bring your soccer kids back till, you know, maybe a week before school started, at least up in the Northeast. Now, baseball goes to Memorial Day, right? You have all June is packed with meetings. Right? You, you, there is no June, really. And then you're bringing kids back the first week of August. I mean, our, our, our summer time, which is traditionally slower, has now been reduced to about 45 days. Um, June is not as slow as you would think, Sam. That I will tell you. <laughs> well, you guys certainly made it eventful, which I, I appreciate. And this has been really cool. And um, just to be a part of, of this announcement and, and seeing the whole progress. Now, Amy, I, I'll ask you, since I know you're on some commissioner's calls, what was – was, did, were there any reactions from some of your colleagues and peers uh, around the country in terms of adding this uh, institution, adding NJIT, and specifically, I guess, at this time? You know, not a ton right now, Sam, since it was just announced last Friday. I think, um, you know, as, as we go into this week, when, when my calls really pick up, I think maybe we'll see. I've heard from a number of colleagues, you know, the congratulations and things like that, and um, wanting to know a little bit of the inside inside scoop or inside baseball about how we were able to move this quickly and how we were able to move um, mostly under the radar. Uh, you yeah. know, it didn't leak publicly until about the day before on, on, in, a, in a broad way on social media. And so that's something that was really important to me, really important to Lenny. We talked about that early in the process, talked about that with our, our presidents and athletic, athletics directors about just maintaining confidentiality to protect both parties in case something, you know, fell, went awry. Um, so in that respect, people are always curious, like, how did you keep this a secret for so long? Um, and there's no right or wrong, there's no right way or wrong way to do this sort of thing. But I, that's where I think we've got a really good culture um, and commitment and, and focus from our presidents and athletic directors to really trust the process, trust each other, and trust that this is uh, a really important step and move that we were exploring and examining to strengthen the league and no one wanted to be i don't think a reason why you know maybe it, it went off the track off the rails uh, which it which it certainly could have so in that respect i think you know that's that's the kind of feedback you're getting from some of my commissioner and colleagues but yeah it's you know jokes about you know oh there's not enough on your plate right now oh you're gonna go out of school and things like that but you know it's a, as I said, it's an unusual summer. And so why not just continue to make it a little bit more unusual and add, uh, keep everyone a little bit busier than, than we already are. I think the, you know, the ability to keep it quiet as long as we did was because we kept it in a very small circle of people for most of the time, Sam, only about three other people on my campus knew anything that was going on. Uh, my two associate ADs, um, as well as my president and myself. So, you know, when, when the story broke noon on that Thursday, uh, my basketball coach is getting calls from writers like, hey, you know, here's what I hear. And he's like, what do I tell him? I said, well, tell him what you know, which is nothing, you know, and, and, and that was exactly it. So um, we made it really, really close, almost all the way. Um, and it was the point where we, we, I think Amy would agree, we kind of had the votes. We just needed them to confirm the votes, both from my trustees. Uh, we had to get a, a signed agreement, you know, those three like very big pieces, but we were kind of there um, and we kept it quiet. And, and I will say, um, you know, touching on the smoothness of it, uh, our, my former commissioner, Ted Gumbar, you know, played a big part in that because he had to get some pieces aligned to make it easy for us to go out. And I think they released a very nice statement on our behalf yesterday, which I will say you don't always see when schools leave conferences. A lot of schools leave conferences, you know, kind of like I always say, like in the dark at night. You know, they're in meetings till noon and boom, they're gone. And I know that's happened with the America East and it's, it's happened with, with me and the, the, uh, the A-Sun. So um, I think there were a lot of parties that realized this was a really good move. And we all worked it, literally in the same direction, whether you call it rowing the, rowing the boat or whatever you – crazy uh, limerick or whatever it is you use to, uh, to, to describe it. It's um, – it, it was good and it worked out really well. That's how it was so smooth. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. There, you know, we talked about two parties being America East and NJIT, but there really were three parties involved with this deal, if you will, or arrangement, and that is the ASUN. And so they, Ted and his leadership, just as Lenny said, were really integral to contributing, facilitating this process. So that that should not go, you know, un, un, unnoticed or unmentioned. And I'm glad that Lenny Lenny raised that, and I echo his uh, comments and appreciation to that entire conference. Well, I'm sure it wasn't all sunshine and roses. You guys got to give me some sort of challenge. I know the the leak. I, I may circle back to that if need be, but. Um, you know, Lenny, you have coaches to convince, or maybe not convince, but you're just telling them they're, they're finding a new home. There's certainly adjustments. Amy, you have a board of presidents that, that need to approve it. Was there some sort of hurdle? Not, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't tell my coaches. Uh, we had a phone call while Amy was in her president's meetings. I spoke to my tennis coaches first because I want to give them the heads up because they're obviously not in the conference. Um, and I spoke to my head coaches like at two o'clock that day. Once Amy gave me the, the tweet that they voted, that's when my staff found out. Nobody had any idea really until they saw the tweet. And I'm getting a lot of calls. I'm like, listen, and, and a lot, you know, I just usually I'm pretty quick to answer. I'm a little <laughs> slower. So I think they all knew something was up. You know, um, the guy who tweeted is a person with pretty good um, sources. Um, doesn't make uh, too many mistakes that I know of. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, they, they were just, you know, hey, here's what it is. Like, this is a good move for us. And if you read a lot of my coaches' comments that have since come out, they get it. You know, as Amy said earlier, it's, it's about academics, about being aligned properly with schools. And this week helps us in that way. Uh, besides the fact now in this time that we're in with the, with the end of the pandemic and we don't know how to get around, you know, getting my student athletes off of planes was huge, huge, you, you know. Kids didn't want to do it. Parents didn't want their kids on planes. Other presidents didn't want their kids on planes. So this was, you know, so it really, I, Sam, I'll be honest with you, I don't know that there were any hurdles, at least on my end. I mean, I was, because I've been down this path before, you know, just nervous to, to get the final vote, right? So when people called me and then even after the story broke, and I did speak to that reporter. I said, hey, here's why, you know, I'm not saying a word. I'm, I'm nervous until I get the text from Amy. Um, but that was, I think, for the most part, um, even questions that I was asked from the ADs were really kind of like, you know, not, you know, not, not, there was nothing that was like a deal breaker or say, hey, you know, you really got to do this to, to make this happen. It was, it really, to me, moved pretty, pretty smooth, Amy. I don't know if you have something else. Yeah, yeah, from our end, too, honestly, I don't, you know. You know, I, I wish I, I could give you dirt. There's no, yeah, there's no, there's no dirt, Sam. It, it was it kept <laughs> busy for three weeks straight. I, I worked. I didn't get a weekend. I've been working whatever 21 over 21 days in a row, uh, like fully on on every Saturday and Sunday on those weekends in between there. But other than that, you know, it's as, as we talked about earlier. You're trying to phone phone calls and phone calls and phone calls with presidents and athletic directors, um, and all that sort of thing. But everything sort of fell into place as we had wanted it to and sequence it out from a strategy perspective, candidly. Um, and it all ended up obviously in a very good spot with the unanimous vote last, last Friday. So um, if anything, really, because we were under such a tight timeline, honestly, if something had gone awry, uh, we probably wouldn't have been able to take a vote on Friday. And so I think because we got there, because it was unanimous and didn't spend candidly a lot of time on it in the meeting, um, that, that just proved to me that we had done both, all of us had, had done the right things leading up to that meeting. I, I will say if college athletics worked as well as, as the parties all did in this move, we'd be in a much better spot. Much less headaches. Yeah. Much less headaches. All right. I'll, I'll go back to the leaked, uh, the leaked announcement then since, since you guys seem to have both be in agreement that it, it was truthfully smooth from, from start to finish. And obviously there's a lot of work that went into it. So there's, I mean, you do, you two deserve a lot of the credit and there, there are parties that you've mentioned along the way too, that deserve credit in making it so smooth, but, but how do you deal with leaked information like that, a leaked announcement? And then obviously you two are being contacted, I'm sure uh, every minute once that's released that, you know, is this true? Is there credibility to this? So how, how do you deal with that? Amy, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, I wasn't too worried because it was about 24 hours or so, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more than from when I knew our board was going to be taking up the matter. So in this day and age, honestly, if you can hold something, 
to 24 hours before the decision or announcement is going to be made. I, I view that as a success, candidly. Um, just the way that people talk and how easy it is to post something on social media and get it to, you know, like, like Lenny said, a credible reporter, a credible source, as opposed to just some offshoot. Um, so I, I really wasn't worried about it. I, I was expecting it sooner, candidly, you know, sort of hope for the best plan for the worst. I was planning for leaks to happen earlier than that. And when they didn't, you know, once we're the day before, I'm just sort of like, all right, well, you know, we can't, <laughs> you know, certainly didn't respond to it. Didn't, you know, uh, I thought, you know, Ted Gumbard actually at the A-Sun helped uh, to distract a little bit, you know, um, with some of his back and forth on on Twitter with with Jeff Goodman. And so I thought I thought that maybe helped helped us as much as anything, because that sort of took the attention away. So, um, you know, leaks happen in whatever you're going to do. And just like everything, if you if it's good information, you go with it. If it was inaccurate information, then we probably would have re responded. But um, I think because <laughs> no one saw a response from NJIT, no one saw a response from us, they probably figure this is pretty reliable information. Um, and so I'm good to just hold tight. I don't, I don't love to, you know, talk about that kind of stuff anyway. So uh, no one needs to tell me to keep a secret. Yeah, you know, um, I think Ted did a good job of deflecting, um, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, he went out and said, you know, the, the tweet is wrong. You know, the tweet really wasn't wrong. It was the way it was worded, right? Because the, the guy used the term Atlantic sum, and we don't go by that moniker. It was officially changed a couple of years ago. So he had a ball. I mean, his Twitter blew up for about eight, 10 hours, and he was enjoying it, to be honest with you. Um, and he got a lot of, if you read some of the comments under his, it's really good. I wound up um, speaking to the reporter. Somebody gave him my number. Uh, so he called me. And the funny thing was, he was a 508 area code. So when I picked up the phone, I just assumed it was somebody from the conference office, like, needing something. So I just called them, and I, I, I spoke to them off the record. I said, no, it's, it's, you know, we're close. We're not there. I said, you know, um, he apologized, you know, for getting out in front of it a little bit. Um, but as Amy says, you know, th there's two ways to look at it. First off, it's out there, right? So people can run with it a thousand different directions. Um, and the flip side, it, it wasn't really wrong. So and it wasn't harmful. I mean, we made it three weeks before anything got out. I mean, as I said, my staff had no idea. They knew something was up when I kept delaying, you know, we're talking about scheduling and, and no schedules from the sun yet and things like that. But for the most part, they really didn't know what was up. And they probably thought it could have been another conference. Um, and, and the one thing is, you know, as I speak to my staff, you know, we were working on scheduling. And that's what we were when this all started. And that's kind of like the flow I went with that we're working on regionalized scheduling calendars for everybody, which is, again, how it kind of started. So um, so you just kind of flow with the, you go with the flow with some of these uh, these rumors. And you can have fun a lot of different ways. I'd, le I'd like to say, Sam, that we, you know, we grabbed in Ted and his Twitter account as part of our grandmaster media strategy. I would love to claim that. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't, and I shouldn't because Ted Gumbard is a unique individual and like so gracious and all of this as we've talked about, but also very humorous, you know, curious guy. And so, um, you know, like I said, that, that contributed to it. One thing I will say about it sort of leaking early, if you will, is, uh, you know, you start to read some of the comments and reaction. And for the most part, it was really positive for both the conference and for NJIT. Not that that would have certainly stopped anything that we were doing, but it was just, those are just good signals and indicators that, you know what, this is the right thing for both parties. Um, and so that, that was sort of validating, if you will, heading into our, heading into our board of presidents meeting. I mean, I haven't, I'll say this, you know, I've read a lot of them, not all of them certainly, but because um, my social media and our, our schools has exploded a little bit, but um, you know, I haven't seen anything negative. You know, everybody seems happy for us, happy for you. And says you know, a lot of it, you know, why wasn't it done soon? You know, oh, finally, or travel partner for UMBC, just a lot of like little things like that. But I haven't seen a negative comment, so you know, knock on wood, we'll keep the negativity away a little while longer. It'll come out right. soon from somewhere. I just don't know where yet. Uh, I I echo those too. My eyes have been peeled, and I've, it's been all positive and and really cool actually to follow and see all the comments from Lenny, your coaches some of our athletic directors and presidents and, and it continues to flow. Lenny, I want to go back to something that you mentioned or alluded to a couple of minutes ago in terms of being down this road before. 
Uh, not only have you switched conferences before NJIT, but you made a transition from D2 to D1, which we at the America East are, are rel relatively familiar with, at least Amy is in terms of UMass Lowell being onboarded. But, um, you know, how does this, I guess, compare to that transition? And did, did this seem maybe a little bit easier or, or more difficult with your past, compared to your past experiences? Well, here's what I'll tell you. So nothing's more difficult than going through transition without a conference affiliation. So we started our transition before that was a rule. So when UMass Lowell went, they had to have a conference before they moved, which is great because you have people to ask questions. You know, we were relying on, in most cases, you know, it was only myself and one other person at the time on my staff that had connections through the NCAA Division I to ask questions of. So it was a very, very difficult process to go as an independent. Um, you know, we had a president at the time, you know, that, that moved us a little faster than I would have preferred to move. I would have liked to, you know, have my facilities a little more up to date, which is one of the things that was a, an anchor for us in trying to get into conference. Um, but, you know, so the transition, that's why I say, you know, we just, you know, we're out there as an independent. At the time, there were 11 other independents, you know, so North Dakota, North Dakota State, Northern Colorado at the time, IPFW, it was a whole bunch of us. And that's how the Great West thing kind of formed because we knew we needed a scheduling alliance for basketball. And at least at the end of the year, let's do a conference tournament or to, to, to crown a champion. In which case, at some point, we had our champion going to the CIT. So there was something to play for us at some point. You fast forward that, that lasted a couple of years. And then when everybody kind of scattered, we were the only person left on the East Coast. And we literally the last, we were the last Division One independent ever, I hope. I mean, I wish that on nobody. Um, so unless, you know, a league explodes and, and four of six members, whatever, you know, land, nobody should be an independent again. Um, and so, you know, we, we, again, we went on the independent route. We got lucky, you know, we had a big win against Michigan. They kind of put us on the map and I kind of raised a lot of eyebrows that, you know, what well, we can still compete as an independent, like, how are we doing that? Um, and we had 21 wins that year, I believe. And, and we did really well. We made it to the CIT semifinals. So when something happened that with Northern Kentucky, when, it, when a school left the a -Sun, which was Northern Kentucky, at the last minute, again, not a very gracious departure. Uh, again, kind of under the, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. It just opened up. Um, I mean, we got asked at one point within about 36 hours to stop calling people. because I think we were in touch with about 80 people within the a -Sun at that point. <laughs> um, everybody was on speed dial all of a sudden. I spoke to Ken Cavanaugh, the AD of Florida Coast. He was at UCLA at a tennis match. That's how I tracked him down outside of a Chinese restaurant. I, you know, I mean, there's some great stories. So this transition is, you know, smooth as can be, you know, we have, you have a willing partner, you have two willing partners um, that realize probably at the end, this is a really good thing. Didn't happen for a lot of reasons earlier and that's okay. You know, you gotta be ready to make a move. You know, that you have to be ready to take a member. The members that be ready to come in and be a contributing member of, you know, um, of the league and, I think everything, as Amy said, right place, right time. It just fell into, and it just really, you know, moved it smooth. You know, we've had our bumps, believe me, but we've, we got back up off the mat every time. Well, I know, I know one of the biggest outcomes of this obviously has to do with, with scheduling and I'll throw it right back to you, Lenny. How pumped are you to be, uh, like you said, not, not required to take plane trips and, and be able to, to even do day trips on a number of occasions? Well, I'll, I'll be honest, I may, I may miss Florida in February a little bit. You know, I don't know if the weather's the same in Burlington. Um, but I will say I'm, very, I'm, I'm excited, not so much for, for the kids, right? So our student athletes go on these four-day road trips sometimes, sometimes five. Uh, you know, leave on Wednesday, back on Sunday. My women's basketball team, because the league played Saturday, Monday for the women, you know, they were up at like 3.30 in the morning on a Tuesday to catch that 6 o'clock flight to get back to class on Tuesday. You know, we're a STEM-based institution. Um, so our goal is obviously to get our kids back to class. So, I, you know, I'm really excited for the student athletes that um, in most cases, you know, five schools within 200 miles, they'll be able to sleep in their own bed, usually maybe by 1, 1.30 in the morning, where, you know, in the past, you know, they'd be getting up at, you know, 5, 6 in the morning to get back to class. Uh, so I'm very excited for them. And Amy, from a conference perspective, it it's it comes at a time where we're obviously trying to rearrange some schedules in terms of not knowing what the fall looks like with this pandemic. Yeah, you know, one of the things, and listening to Lenny, I haven't, you know, I spend so much time on the bigger 
bigger picture pieces of this and not so much, you know, I just, cause I'm, we're not on campus, obviously never had student athletes experience what Lenny just described. But as I continue to hear stories like that and think about what that's going to actually mean for an individual student athlete, you know, that's going to be transformational from an athletic experience perspective, as well as an academic perspective, because they're going to be better rested and probably miss less class time and all those types of things. So, you know, when I hear things like that, it makes, it just reinforces why this makes so much sense to me. Um, you know, in terms of scheduling, another reason why I think this makes a lot of sense for, for everyone is at a time when everyone is stretched financially uh, and, and there's still only uncertainty ahead, there's no certainty <laughs> as we, as we look ahead. Um, you know, there's, you know, more talk publicly about leagues that are more spread geographically and, you know, the different adjustments that they've had to make to plan for uncertainty. And I think we are certainly doing the same thing, but what we're doing to adapt to the uncertainty is actually reinforcing the value of our conference membership, uh, the value of our conference footprint. And I think able, we're able to, we're already, I think, as I've tried to describe it, we're, our, our, our geographic footprint is already fairly compact when you, when you compare it to most other division one conferences. And by, we were focused on sort of a hyper-regionalized model as we were going through the different fall sports scenario groups that we've been working on for the past few weeks. And then you insert NJIT to that, we don't have to, that doesn't disrupt anything of what we were doing. It actually just reinforces our ability to hyper-regionalize in volleyball and, and men's and women's soccer in particular. And so, and I think we'll see that play out as, as the year goes on. So uh, I think it, it's sort of a doubling down on one of our, uh, you know, I think most valuable assets, which is our geographic footprint, while also doubling down on our academic and institutional profile. Um, so then again, when you think about it through those lenses, as well as what they're gonna be able to contribute uh, athletically, both on the performance standpoint, as well as on the scheduling standpoint, it just, you know, now that it's in the rear view mirror a little bit, it just makes so much, so much sense. Like there's just no room in my view for, skepticism or questioning about why this move was made by, by either party. Um, so I feel really, really good. I'm really bullish on, on adding them and how they're going to fit into our league, both short term and then really in the long term. And that's something that we talked about as a league too. You know, it certainly affords NJIT some immediate advantages around travel, for example, and scheduling. Um, but this wasn't just a reactionary move for the short term. Um, it, it, it's, it's really to position our conference for the long term. And I, I really do believe in that because of the institutional profile, because of the geography. I think uh, it just makes us stronger, both in the uncertainty. And then whenever we get to certainty again, you know, we're going to be standing really, really proudly and really strongly as we look ahead. Speaking of look ahead. Like we talked about, the announcement has been made, but it won't become official until July 1. So my question, my parting question to, to both of you is, what are the next steps? What can we look ahead to um, as we continue to integrate NJIT into the America East Conference? Well, uh, right now it's about absorbing all the information you all are sending us. Um, there's a lot of information. Uh, some of my staff has to read all of it. Uh, you know, coaches kind of get it easy. They read their one sport, right? Um, <laughs> But somebody, you know, the sport administrators in some cases have multiple sports. So now we just have to go go through to see how it differs. There are some sports that may differ a lot, like baseball. Um, you know, in the A Sun, it's a very high level baseball. You know, not that the American East isn't, but you know, they play in a stratosphere that some of their teams that um, they'll get a number of first round draft picks every year, <clears throat> and we're lucky sometimes to get one as a Northeast based conference, right? So. Um, there are some differences, um, you know, everything on the media side. Um, of course, Stephanie's got a lot to absorb in social media. You know, your staff, with all your um, social media, is a little bigger than our staff. Um, we spread out um, assignments, so everybody does a little bit of everything. So that's it. I, you know, right now, um, you know, travel, once we get um, schedules, that'll be done. That'll be sent. That's the simplest part, I think, is, you know, figure out what you're playing. Like right now, a coach is a little anxious. We have dates, which is better. Uh, no one, we don't have to worry about making <laughs> plane, plane flights and, and, and airline arrangements uh, and then shifting from hotel to hotel on, on, a, on, a, on an individual trip. Um, so the travel stuff, you know, my travel guy is chomping at the bit to, you know, lock down some stuff. He likes to negotiate and, and, and get a good deal at certain places. 
Um, Steph's just trying to get, you know, the, the, the ESPN or even the streaming schedule up and going. Um, you know, we've done ESPN 3 before and ESPN Plus before, so that won't be hard to do, but now you got to make sure all the back stuff is done. Like all the details you did once, like five years ago, now you actually got to go in and change everything from, you know, conference A to conference B, so it's going in the right direction. Um, so, yeah, it's just going to be, it's a lot of, uh, you know, really it's just a lot of office work, but you know what, it's, uh, it's exciting for us, so it's not it's not really busy work. It's it's kind of exciting, you know. So for us, you know, my I know my staff is is chomping at the bit to get going on that. Amy, your thoughts? Yeah, same for us. I mean, our staff is certainly clearly sending Lenny and his team a lot of information and materials, um, and giving them lots of homework to do. But you know, there's the mechanics and logistics of getting them integrated. What I'm what I'm mostly looking forward to is, you know, having Lenny around our AD table, having Peg around the SWA table, having Andrew involved with our CCC and, and Dr. Bloom with our presidents and just seeing how, um, you know, those four leaders and then all of the rest of their staff start to integrate, whether it's compliance or academics or our, our content team stuff, how they just integrate with our, our stakeholder groups in our league. You know, I think we have a really good culture of collaboration and respect and, and trust among our our you know, exit, you know, continuing nine members. I think we've worked really hard on that as a league office and as a league uh, all together from, from every corner, if you will, across a campus and how we connect with them. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see what NJT is going to contribute and how they can make us even better. And then, you know, what we can share and, and continue to work on helping our schools do what they need to do and want to do and meet their objectives, but also, you know, seeing what new objectives come forward from the American East. So I think, I'm a believer in, you know, having smart people around the table, you're going to generate, you know, great ideas. And now we've got another great partner at the table with us. And I'm really excited to see how that unfolds over the next, in the next several years, actually. I'd echo that. Lenny, looking forward to working with you and your staff. Congratulations to both of you for, for getting this done and excited to see how, how we, uh, the partnership moves forward. But um, thank you for, for taking the time. And Lenny, on behalf of the America East Conference, welcome. Thank you, Sam. Very excited to get going. So I'm looking forward to meeting everybody in person.